Okay, we're going to start back up now. If you would come. As we had said earlier, we've gathered a group of presidents who are, have agreed to continue this conversation around college affordability and what it means for them in their campuses and uh, to avoid the, to the, the, the idea of going through each one of their bios. We've included their bios in your program there. And if you see each of them are presidents that uh, bring a tremendous wealth of experience and knowledge to the higher education community throughout their different uh, administrative skill sets they've been involved in. And so we're delighted to have them here with us this afternoon. And we've tried to uh, create a wide range of uh, diversity amongst the institutions that you'll see here this afternoon to continue our conversation around affordability and what it means based on some of the comments you've already heard from Dr. Garcia, as well as with on their own institutional campuses. So they, um, oh, I, 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 I don't want to say they flip coins or fill cards. Mm -hmm in terms of order, that would probably would not be the right thing to say here in Reno, but, but anyway, they, they came up with a device for deciding who would go first and who would follow. And so, um, as I said, the bios are there uh, uh, in, in, on your pages, and we're delighted to have them here with us to continue this conversation. And we're, we're running a little ahead of schedules. We're gonna leave some time, hopefully, at the end of this conversation to engage in some uh, questions and comments from you in the audience for you to be able to share with us some of the issues and challenges that you're facing as well around affordability issues on your particular campuses and what your students are facing and how we might be able to better address those moving forward. So uh, we'll start off now with Dr. Javier Savalas, who's gonna kick us off with some comments and uh, presentation regarding his institution. So Dr. Savalas. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haskell, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. And I have a very brief PowerPoint. I'm not gonna go through all the slides, I promise, but it's just that the slides tell a story, and I want to go to that story. But uh, you know, if you want to talk about that more in detail later on, I'll be happy to share with you uh, the, the full slides and tell you whatever you want about it. And it is about the equity agenda in Massachusetts. The Board of Higher Education in Massachusetts that oversees all public institutions in the state came up this year with the only priority, equity. And I think that it is the only state that I'm aware of in which the public institutions have decided that there's only one priority for the system, and that is equity. And part of that is because what we're gonna be doing, looking at some of these slides. So we have to really think about how are we gonna be supporting our students, and you all know these things, you know, the way that we support students, and what we wanted to do was to do this based on data and not on just gut feelings. We wanted to have evidence of what is happening so that we can really address the issues once we find these issues. So affordability, of course, is the most important thing that we have been all talking about. That's what financial aid is all about, and affordability is crucial. We all know that. And as we all know, we have unmet need and met need, direct, direct cost, indirect cost, et cetera. So how is that affecting our students? And that's, how is that gonna be affecting our institutions? As Dr. Garcia mentioned, the main reason for these challenges is the disinvestment that the states have had. And you can see very briefly and quickly a summary of how community colleges, the state universities, and the University of Massachusetts system, how the costs have gone from 2008 to now. And this is both, the, the lower line is the direct cost of tuition and fees, the top line is of course total cost of attendance, that is what the students really care about. And here we have also these graphics, the amount of unmet need versus the, for both direct and indirect costs that we have for our students divided into three sectors because obviously in Massachusetts we have to do with that. Not surprising community colleges have a, a, a significant difference in that. The total scope of unmet need in Massachusetts for the students in the public sector right now is $104 million. In Massachusetts we are actually asking the state to invest $104 million in education for our higher education program. I just have to remind you that Massachusetts just signed a law a couple of days ago that I want to invest $1.7 billion in K-12 over the next seven years. So $100 million may sound like a lot of money. In that context, it is not. So we really want to, to push that. And then how are we going to be addressing unmet need? We started to look at how our students are doing. And now we wanted to look at that by African-American, Latinx, and white students. 
and trying to see how that compares. And these all, by the way, all these numbers are based only on FAFSA students, FAFSA completers, because obviously uh, we, do, we do not ask about um, documental status for students that come to our campuses, but the, if they're not allowed to file a FAFSA, we cannot uh, analyze how their experience is. And we, know, or we, or we all know that they have a different experience. So the, the interesting thing about this, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but if you just look at the colors and the graphs, you can see that students that have unmet need, students that go from zero estimated family contribution, students that go from $1 to the pill limit, and the pill limit to 15,000 or 5,000 and above, with very small differences, the percentages are not that different in, in terms of African-American, Latino, and white students. It's a small variance, but it's not that significant. And the same thing when you do by the, you know, with a, for both a unmet, total unmet, total cost of attendance, and when we look up again by distribution by segment, we have community colleges, states, and universities. Now, it starts affecting, it starts changing when we look at enrollment, how percentage of students are taking full-time enrollment courses as opposed to not. And as I tell you, all these graphics tell us to one story, and this is the story that I wanted to tell you. The story is that we now know that over six years, and these are the students that have completed in some way, in some place, over six years, and we have obviously, thanks to the Clearing House, the data, 65% of white students with net mid have graduated in six years. 54% of white students with unmet need have graduated in six years. Look at what happens with African American and Latinx students with full met need. They are graduating 10 percentage points or worse than white students with unmet need. So what is the story that we have to understand in Massachusetts? It is not only money. It is not only money. It is that we have to make our campuses truly inclusive. We have to really change the culture of our institutions. We have to make students come and feel welcome. And we are doing a few things, and I'll share with you later on when we have question and answer some of the things that we're doing. But that is, again, the point that we were talking about. How do we make students feel absolutely welcome? So this is the slide that I, was, that I really wanted to show you because now it shows with evidence and with facts that there is a problem and this gap has to be closed. We have to make sure that this gap disappears. All right, I think that I'll pass it now to my distinguished colleague from uh, Phillips College, Adinia. Thank you. You can just close this camera and move it or whatever. Good afternoon, colleagues. I am pleased and honored to respond to Dr. Garcia and to talk about how we are addressing the challenges that our students, all of our students are facing in regards to achieving uh, higher education. St. Philip's College is one of the Alamo colleges that you heard General Brown speak about. We are now celebrating 122 years in existence. 88% of our students are part-time. We have over 13,600 students that are currently enrolled. We are a two-year institution, and most proudly, and we focus on transfer and workforce programs. In 2018, we received the Governor's Award for Performance Excellence, the TAPE Award, and in 2018, as one of the Alamo Colleges, which is most unique, the, all of the Alamo Colleges, that is five independently accredited institutions, we all received the Malcolm Bowridge Award. And so that is the highest award in our nation that is get, grant, given in our nation's capital for performance excellence. We have at St. Philip's College, I'm always proud to say, we have never sent out a rejection letter. We take the masses of humanity. Whether the students are prepared or not, they come to us with career goals. It is our job to ensure not only addressing the financial needs, but we provide them with a career ladder to accomplish that career goal because often they are not ready. We have the academically talented and capable and the academically challenged, and we have to respond to all of them. While you heard, we, we spoke about equity. Equity is one of the performance measures that we must address all of the presidents in the Alamo colleges. However, it is just one. It is not the only uh, benchmark that we have to address. We are like many of you, we have more females registered and enrolled than males, but graduation, we are more 
award more degrees and certificates to males for the past five years. So that is something we're very proud of. Our default rate is below that of the national average. It's roughly 10.6%. And then we have a student satisfaction survey about how well are we doing. And for the 2019, our student satisfaction survey was actually at 94%. So the students are saying they are well satisfied and they will recommend our institution to someone else. The goal simply is to prepare students for a living wage, not minimum wage, but a living wage. So how do we do that when we're talking about some of the things that Dr. Garcia mentioned? She gave us five strategies that we needed to respond to. So we're talking about partnerships and how do we partner? We have many partnerships, not only at St. Phillips College, but all of the Alamo colleges. So I will reference one. First, the Alamo colleges. When we look at who's enrolling in higher ed, and we're all two-year institutions, 40% of the students in San Antonio, after graduating from high school, go nowhere. They go nowhere. But we all know somebody's supporting them, and that's us. So we came up with the Alamo Colleges, the Alamo Promise. And this is where we're saying that we want to create opportunities for those students that are simply sitting at home. They're not working, nor are they enrolled in higher education. And the Alamo Promise is we're saying that it's not necessarily free, but what we've been doing is partnering with the city of San Antonio and Bear County to create ways to address the unmet needs. So we're encouraging all of the students to apply for financial aid, and that's filling out the FAFSA, and then addressing their unmet needs with monies from the city of San Antonio, monies from Bear County, and all of the foundations that we are lining up to support this very robust agenda. And we had identified roughly 9,000 students. We identified 25 schools the first year that had the most uh, students with the most need-based need uh, bases, um, were most challenging. And those 25 schools would net roughly 9,000 students. So far in our campaign, we have over 5,000 students that have signed up to say, save my seat. I'm interested. So we've been working with that, and then the next year we will address uh, 20 more schools in the Alamo Colleges. So that is the largest partnership for all of the colleges. But in regards to St. Phillips College in particular, how do we address the needs of students? When we're talking about creating opportunities for engaging students in higher education, we know that it is a lot more than finances. And we have been intentional about addressing those needs. Our partnerships have included things with the San Antonio Food Bank, because we talk about food insecurity. In Texas, one in four individuals are food insecure. We have partnerships with Starbucks, Bimbo Bakery, where we're making food available and addressing the food insecurities of our students. Uh, and then when we're talking about housing insecurity, we have now established a partnership. We've been working with the San Antonio Housing Authority to create housing for our students. And this is where they will be building micro homes. And in building those micro homes, we're giving opportunities for our students to have a place to live as long as they continue successfully making satisfactory progress. And we're building starting out with 20, and then we'll continue to add. Uh, but this is our newest venture for addressing the homeless issue with regards to our students. Um, when we're talking about increasing the Pell Grants, well, at St. Phillips College and all of the Alamo Colleges, when we look at tuition costs, and we are two-year institutions, spread over the two years is roughly $5,000. And you compare it to what some of yours, you may say that is very, very low. But at the same time, our students, 88% of them are part-time, which says that education is but one of the competing priorities in their lives. So they're needing additional resources to sustain themselves and their families. We discovered that the students were taking out loan debt, loans that far exceeded the cost of attending one of the Alamo Colleges or St. Phillips College. And as a result of that, it was for living for supporting families, for supporting children, for supporting themselves. And so we've invested heavily in financial literacy to support our students. 
for the housing. I mentioned the San Antonio Housing Authority. And then what we have done is St. Phillips College, when we're talking about uh, increasing the Pell Grant, we know that all of the monies can't come from the federal government or from state aid. So we have our own fundraising opportunities at the college. And it has been through a golf tournament, and we've raised more than a million dollars through golfing. And we have supported now more than 1,049 students. And in this, there are two opportunities to receive financial support for our students. They can work on the campus. We have what we call the student engagement grants. And those student engagement grants, the students have to give back on the campus. An example of a student giving back would be our accounting students. They have to do income tax returns for people in our community. And then that is how they earn their scholarship money. Uh, last year, well, this past year, they did more than 4,000 income tax returns, generating more than $8 million in refund monies for people in our community. Um, we have students that can be student government. If they're in student government, they, are, they can receive a student engagement grant. They will receive a student engagement grant which it says we have great expectations for you to fulfill your responsibilities as student leaders. They can be student ambassadors uh, working in our math world or our Rose Thomas Writing Center or the Bird Sanctuary, many different environments, opportunities for them to give back on the campus. Also with the monies that we raise, we have the presidential scholars they have an opportunity to give back in the community. Those are the students that meet with me on a regular basis. They do a monthly impact report and they talk about the impact that they're having in their community and we approach it from a project management uh, stance in terms of those students. So how do we support the students? It is through our own fundraising at the campus and then giving the students an opportunity to augment or support their, their financial needs because more than 70% of our students have financial needs. And so not only through their financial aid, but also through the fundraising, and that requirement is that they give back. In addition to that, the monies that we raise on the campus, when the students, when they're approaching, you know, when it's time to, um, when it's uh, drop time, if you have not find, paid your final bill, uh, classes are starting, any student that has a balance of 100 and $50 or more, we simply pay it. We don't drop students for $150 or more, but that is through our robust fundraising efforts on the campus to save those students, and we never tell them, I think they think that the ferry has just come along or somehow we made a glitch in the system and we forgot to contact them about that $150 or $100 or $90 that they owe, we simply cover it. Other things that we do when we're talking about opportunities to increase the Pell Grant is that not only we do fundraising, but we look at those, we have a textbook loan program, things that I'm sure that you are able to do or you might already be doing, or a computer loan program. And in addition to the textbook loan program, uh, you get a gold card. If you return the textbook in a timely manner, then you can have another uh, textbook loan program for the next semester. We also look at all of the core courses and what are some of the major textbooks that the students need, and we put them in the library. So if a student is not able to purchase the textbook, then it is in the library. They can check it out for a minimum of two hours at a time so they have access to the textbook. And that's one of the other strategies that we use for addressing their unmet needs. The same thing goes for the computer loan, where they have an opportunity to check out the computers. They get a gold card. If they're very attentive in returning the computer, then they have an opportunity and get first preference for checking out a computer for the next semester. Uh, those are some of the things that we're doing. When we're talking about, when Dr. Garcia mentioned uh, simplify the FAFSA and then educate the parents, well, the majority of our students probably like many of yours, are first generations, first in the family. At home, there is limited understanding of how to complete the FAFSA. There is limited, limited to no understanding to even being able to interpret what the question is asking. So we are very intentional. We have financial aid Saturdays on the first Saturday of every month, and we invite individuals in the recruiting opportunity to come to the campus, and we work with the parents. During new student orientations and recruitment opportunities, we have special sessions that are set aside just for the parents where we will walk them through the FAFSA, the financial aid, 
And then they have an opportunity to also call in. We have a phone bank where people can call in. In addition to that, we also work with more than 100 high school counselors advising them about how they can be intentional about communicating to the students that may potentially be enrolled in St. Phillips College. So we try to cover it in the high schools, in the homes, and then reaching out to the community. When we have things such as our Culture Fest, we will bring in over 800 students from various high schools, introducing them to the various career options and also to the FAFSA mm -hmm. form and communicating with their parents or the individual that they are responsible for um, in completing the form. The other is we talked about paid internships. Dr. Garcia mentioned paid internships. One of the examples that is coming now with all of our students that are in the workforce programs and they are required to do internships, externships, and we seek to get them paid internships. One thing that we're launching even this uh, January is working with Methodist Healthcare Systems where they're saying we will take all of your cardiovascular students for internships and they will be paid internships and we will guarantee them a job. So we're looking at the needs of the workforce community and then ensuring that we are responding to their needs and then connecting our students with not only the career pathway, the internship, but then employment down the road. And that is something that we're very proud of. Um, and lastly, uh, just in, in general, we have started this year an advocacy effort at St. Phillips College. And the advocacy is looking at the total needs of the students. And so we established what we call a safe space and in that safe space, uh, we have a food pantry. And I mentioned earlier that we were partnering with the San Antonio Food Bank, Starbucks, because they bring to us, they will now be delivering at 4 a.m. every day their products that did not sell. They even donated a refrigerator for those things that needed to be stored and refrigerated. And that was just installed last week. Within the safe space, not only do we have the food pantry, we have two crisis counselors. So for whatever it is, we're communicating to the students, whatever the challenges you may have, dropping out is not an option. And we've been in business for more than 100 years, so we don't think you can introduce a new problem that we can't address. Uh, we have disability services present there. The Title IX services are in that area. The Violence Against Women, we have a Department of Justice grant that is also there, and financial literacy. We have a very robust effort in financial literacy to work with our students, and then career placement. The onboarding process now has been narrowed to just institutes. So the students will enter through six possible institutes, and we have experiential learning opportunities attached to those, those institutes where we use student funds the student activity funds to support them with their experiential learning. So in addition to those things that Dr. Garcia mentioned, we're being attentive to that, and then we have the student advocacy program that is taking place at St. Phillips College. I think I have covered all of those areas, so I'm happy to share and answer any questions that you may have later. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lonesten, for those remarks. Also, thank you, Javier, for beginning our, our panel. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Juan Munoz. I have the uh, pleasure of serving as president of the University of Houston downtown. And I couldn't be more excited uh, to talk about presidential behavior. No. <laughs> Got your attention, didn't I? All right, very good. So I think it's very important to talk about uh, financial aid in the context of presidential behavior because the things that we do and the decisions we make and the conversations we encourage and or suppress uh, have implications. So I also, I'd, I'd like to just uh, remind you of the obvious that I think when we talk about this uh, uh, presidents and chancellors of minority uh, serving institutions, uh, you've heard, uh, hopefully you've heard uh, Dr. Garcia uh, talk about this for many years uh, before she was uh, at ASKU about the important role that ASKU and uh, minority serving institutions, HBCUs, tribal colleges play in educating the emerging population for higher education. We overwhelmingly and disproportionately educate minority and first generation low income students, transfer students, much more so than very selective, prestigious private and public schools. 
I think that that's important in terms of who sits in the presidency and the people that they surround themselves with to make the kinds of decisions to address the kinds of challenges Dr. Garcia introduced in her remarks. I want to thank, uh, the, of course, the Department of Education and its uh, Office of Financial Aid and, uh, and, uh, for this panel. And I want to talk about uh, some of the topics that Dr. Garcia mentioned, but they shouldn't be topics that are uh, unusual to us. This principle of remaining affordable. Uh, we hear it often. How do you remain affordable, accessible, and achievable? Not just affordable. You might be in some location nobody can get to. You're very inexpensive, just nobody can get to you. There are challenges now, increasingly in mobility. Now, I have the, the, the benefit of, of, of my, our institution, just as a coincidence, uh, Houston was founded by the Allen brothers. They exited a watercraft at Allen's Landing. That's where my university is, Allen's Landing. So we're surrounded by, I don't know, a modest 6.5 million people. That's very different if you're in a very rural environment when I work in West Texas at Texas Tech. Okay. So it's not simply about affordability, but how do you organize affordability, accessibility with achievability to ensure that the students that you're recruiting have the financial resources, the academic services, the climate to be successful and to graduate. Now, as a president, uh, I lived in West Texas for a long, long time. When I went to Houston, I said, I'm gonna visit every high school within 50 miles of my campus. <laughs> well, in Lubbock, Texas, y'all, that may be 15 schools. In Houston, it's like three. So I'm on like school, I'm on high school 48. And I'll be at Scarborough High School tomorrow morning, uh, or Wednesday morning. So uh, I want to talk about this idea of, of simplifying the process uh, and, uh, and maximizing the resources, this point that Dr. Garcia made about year-round. Not just increasing the Pell Grant, but year-round Pell Grant. How do we think about that? These students are not interrupting voluntarily their education. They're having to interrupt their education because of mobility issues, because of family issues, uh, because of other uh, more pressing financial obligations. Uh, you might have heard of a small water event called Harvey. We had 39 inches of water inside the building over just, a, just about nine and a half million dollars worth of damage. I met young people that had lost everything. And when I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything in their home. Their vehicle was inundated. It was a submarine. Their mother and father lost their home. Their siblings lost their homes. And then you say, don't, don't, you know, remember, school, we're resuming classes on Monday. Again, okay, how do we, how do we think about these things that are impacting our students today? The average age of uh, my population, I remember saying this at an event in Texas, both uh, Dr. Lonston and I are in Texas, and then hearing the president of Texas Women's College say the same thing. And then the, talk, the, the president of UT San Antonio, Taylor Amy, say the same thing. And then my friend uh, Austin Lane at Texas Southern, which is a historically black college, say the same thing. Our, our students are overwhelmingly transfer students, overwhelmingly low to modest income, overwhelmingly relying on public transportation, overwhelming. The new traditional, we talk about traditional students, we're, we, are, we are past post-traditional students. We've got people coming back with excess credit, credit and no degree. We have four million Texans that have some college and no credential. It's a burden on them, their family, their financial aid, and the state of Texas. How do we simplify this process and how do we maximize the resources that are available because when Dr. Garcia says there are any number of you know, tens of millions of dollars being, being left uh, to, to, uh, to disseminate an award, we need to think differently about how to take advantage, okay, about how to be more nimble with this money so that none of it goes to waste. Uh, think about uh, the students where they're at. She made this point in her remarks, where they're at, not where we would like them to be. When I taught ninth grade English, when I taught ninth grade English in, in, in Southern California, a little town called Montebello just outside of LA, they say, well, you know, you may not like or you may not, uh, you know, may not be impressed by the caliber of the students that you have today, but they're the very best that that family can send you. I'm gonna pause for effect, okay. 
My first department chair, Vicki Costa, she used to say, uh, I taught in a college of education, secondary education, and she, she used to say, when people ask you, what do you make as a teacher? She would talk to a room full of 500, just like us, educators, from the word educar, to draw out. You should say, well, how much does an educator make? How much does an, what is it that an educator make? How much does an educator make? And she would say, a difference. Which when I talk about the UH downtown, I always talk about the D make, it's for the difference. No, that's just an aside. Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate the help with the laughter, thank you. So we need to broaden again, our, uh, we need to broaden our stakeholders and the people that we're involving in, in, in explaining this process in order to simplify and maximize. You cannot do it, in my opinion, with just these students. Some are very sophisticated. Some are adults and they're very focused and they're very meticulous and they're very methodical. Many are not. Many are not. On the way here from my hotel room, I was involving myself in a student case at another university. His father is a superintendent of a K-12 district. This son has gone to one of the best schools in Houston and has trouble with some of the, the application. His parent, is obviously, is a superintendent with a doctorate. His mother works in the district. He went to one of the best public schools in Houston, and he's having trouble. Okay, these are complicated. And then, and, then, and, then, and then if you happen to come from a family of migrants, nacidos en otro, en otro, en otro país, they, don't have, they have a very limited command of the English language, and you put this form in front of them, and then you ask your mom or your dad, I need your help with this, and then they feel a little embarrassed. And you, as a son or daughter, you're going to press your father? Hey, apa, ¿sabes qué? Necesito que te me sientas pa que me ayudas con este papel. Hey, dad, sit down here so you can help me with this. You're going to talk to your father like that? Maybe things have changed since the 80s when I grew up. <laughs> But I have three boys, and I'm not sure they're going to talk to me. We, okay, these are the complications in today's population of students. We need to think about how to work with families and schools and non-government entities, including churches, okay, to help make comprehensible, for some, an incomprehensible process. Because having them not in the process is a liability to our country. And some of the things at UH Downtown that we've tried to do, we've tried to think about using social media more dynamically. We're doing geofencing. So when that you walk into campus, a message hits your, your, your phone. It reminds you of some form or some process or some application or some scholarship. We're doing, we're, we're doing gamification. I said to my dean, Scott Marzelli, I go, are, are you Paolo Freddy? Are you just making words up now, Scott? You know, conscientization? He said, no, 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 gamification. We're using push techniques and nudge techniques. And they accumulate points. And they can convert these points into a free t-shirt. How are we using technology to communicate information related to this process? We've created at our university, and many in the state of Texas have it, some kind of promise. If your family makes under a certain amount, in our case, it's 50000 In other cases, A&M, UT, that have a bit uh, a bit, more, uh, a bit more generous resources, it might be 60, 65, 70,000. If your families make that much and you can verify it through the FAFSA, then we can put together enough Pell Grant, Texas Grant, and institutional grant so that you can attend college for free for four years. No tuition, no fees for four years, which means you don't have to work. And you've already heard my colleague earlier 70% of her, of, her, of her students require some form of financial aid. The majority have to work. The majority of my campus work. So over 70% require some financial aid. 50% are Pell eligible. There's probably more that are Pell eligible than never even apply. So how do we use technology? How do we create programs and scholarships that, that, that maximize, as Dr. Garcia says, uh, the Pell Grant and of course, we're supportive of increasing the Pell Grant as well. The University of Houston downtown is the second largest in the city of Houston. The city of Houston is the largest city in Texas. We're the second largest at just about 15,000. We're the second largest and we're the, the most affordable, the least expensive public university in Houston and maybe the third least expensive in the state of Texas, third or fourth in the state of Texas. So we have many students 
that are interested because of our price point. And it's still excessively expensive for those populations as well. How do we think about programs? You mentioned, uh, um, uh, just uh, she mentioned, uh, Dr. Lowston uh, mentioned about these, these grants that students may or may not know that they're receiving. We piloted that this year. If you had a hold, we have students that don't come back for, for a $25 hold for, for a parking ticket, for a parking ticket. Anybody under a certain threshold, I can't remember if it was 500 or 750 financial hold in the previous semester, okay? We took care of it if we knew they were receiving financial aid, if they were eligible. It was about a $215,000, $220,000 risk for about 210 students, okay? All but one came back. All but one came back. We had to be prepared to walk away from that almost quarter of a million. And all but all, every one of those students came back. We've got to think about uh, being innovative, being dynamic, being nimble, and responding with initiatives to the students that we have. Not the ones that we, that we, that we recall from years ago, but the ones that are coming to our campus today. We've created affordable bachelor programs, accelerated programs with our community college partners. And I want to mention this program, if you, any of you are interested, called Houston GPS, Houston Guided Pathways for Success. 13 universities and colleges, 13 university and community colleges working together, sharing, for the most part, a common advising platform to, see, to, to ensure 100% of courses attempted at the community college are transferable to the degree of your choice, not the one we tell you that you are eligible for when you finally come into the, uh, the, the four-year institution. We've got to create programs like affordable degrees that take advantage of workforce credit, competency credit, assigned through the community colleges but recognized at four-year schools. Obviously, you've heard about the making a, make greater use of open access materials. What we have today, in my opinion, is we have a different population of students. They're older. They're in greater need. Many are coming back to school to finish. Many are coming back to school to begin. Many are coming back to retool. To upskill is the term. To upskill. We have a tremendous opportunity. And one thing that I don't hear, okay, is a narrative of prosperity. It's astounding to me when people make this argument about whether college is necessary. You talk to poor people that went to college. Talk to poor people that, that, that had to stand in line for government cheese. Y'all don't remember the government, or the food stamps. Now they have these nice credit cards, but back in the 70s, do you remember? You remember. They had the coupons. You had to tear them out like this, right? Dr. Garcia? Okay. I mean, we've got, a, we've got a different population, and they want a better life, and, we, and we, often, we often fail to talk about the return on investment of Pell and other financial support sort of uh, uh, programs. We, we, we fail at, at the U University of Houston downtown. If you graduate from our university, and again, 28, 27-year-old average, two-thirds are transfer students. Many of them, many of them have their own homes and families already are working, overwhelming, working. And when you, when you graduate from UH downtown, you add thirty to $33,000 a year to your salary, a million over the course of your life. You improve your life, your family's life, the region, the city, the state, the country. And yet somehow we're having to argue as to the value of these kinds of services and why increasing Pell Grant might be in our best interest. Increasing Pell Grant in the service of increasing student success. And success means graduating from college. Not attending, not proximity, not referencing, but completing. Not with some college, but completing college. And we've gotta, we've gotta make that part of the narrative as well, okay? Because the new economy, I'll just leave you with these two points. 98% of the jobs created in the last 10 years required some college. What if you have no college? My compadre drives a truck for UPS. I went to college, he went to UPS from my high school. We were together a few weeks ago, he goes, I'm training this vehicle. It's following me. It's learning my route. I go, what do you mean learning your route? Yeah, yeah, it's a manless vehicle. I go, when you hit the frenos, 
Let me know if I have to translate. <laughs> Breaks. I said, what happens? He goes, well, it stops. So it's recording my route. I go, what happens when it fully records your route? I go, well, I guess eventually it's going to take my route. <laughs> I go, Charlie, what are you going to do then? He goes, it's okay. I'm, I'm retiring in three years. I go, what about the Charlies behind you? He goes, I don't know. I remember when I loaded trucks for UPS. It was hard work. You remember? I loaded the brownies and the long ones. Okay? Yeah, you know, you know, that's for real. Okay. What happens? 30 million Americans require on this industry. 98% of the jobs created in the last 10 years require some college. What happens if you have no college and no promise for college? I'll share something else with you. Last year was the first time in this country where the majority of first, first graders in our country were minority. Now, those first graders are going to grow up to be third graders, we hope, and then fifth graders, right? What kind of future? What kind of, what kind of industries will they move into? And what kind of higher education will we create through Pell Grant, federal grant, our own grant, state grants, to ensure them the same kind of hope that most of us recognize we've taken advantage of. And so I think this is the challenge for our behaviors, particularly at these schools, because these schools are of such immense consequence to the history, to the future of our country. So I'm happy to answer some questions and then turn it over to my colleague. Andale, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I also want to uh, ask, uh, thank everybody for the opportunity to, to speak to you. Uh, I'm going to try to summarize very briefly what institution I'm coming from so that you get a sense uh, of, uh, of the kind of student population we have. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, things that we've been trying to do to help students deal with the financial challenges that they, um, that they experience. Uh, I, I would have to say that the three speakers prior to me uh, have uh, uh, given great uh, advice and some of the things that actually you talked about, Juan, are things that I'm also doing personally, but also the institution. So I may touch on them for a little bit. But so we have about 11,000 students at the university, 60% women, 40% men. Um, we have uh, about a 650 international students. Uh, we have that from uh, having started with 1,200, uh, but in the last two years or so, we've lost a significant number of international students. Um, we are quickly becoming an HSI. We now are at 2% Hispanic students. So we're <laughs> so 2%. <laughs> So, um, no, we're trying hard, but uh, uh, we're in a relatively rural area. We actually have about 8% African-American students. Many of our students come from the St. Louis area, uh, pr pr primarily. Some from Memphis um, and Nashville. Uh, most of our students actually out of state come from Illinois, as a matter of fact. And that may be changing. Uh, the new governor has been putting a lot of resources into higher education. Anybody from Illinois here? Yes, yes, so you probably are experiencing that. Anybody from Missouri here? No? Okay, so I, I can speak freely then. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have five colleges uh, at the university. We did something very unusual in the last two years. We literally uh, reorganized all of academic affairs. So we didn't just leave the colleges that they, we had there and change departments. We actually re organize the colleges themselves. And so uh, that was a very stressful time for everybody, including the faculty at the university. But we have uh, come out of that uh, okay. Um, we have uh, been putting a lot of effort into making sure that we increase our retention and graduation rates. Uh, one of the things that I did when I first came, uh, I said, I want to make sure that our goals are known by the students, not only by the staff and the faculty, but I want the students to know that. And so we, uh, we spent a lot of time telling the students that we wanted to achieve an 80% retention rate 
and a 60% graduation rate. And of course, um, many of, uh, of people in, in, in uh, the president's cabinet went like, well, that's like an aspirational goal. And I said, <laughs> well, all goals are aspirational. I don't know what that means, but uh, so we have been working hard. We actually have achieved our highest retention ever this last year, 75 and a half percent. So I think that's good. And we're about 50% in their graduation rate. And we're working hard. And what we're doing is we're looking at what obstacles we are putting in front of the students that we don't even realize. So when you are working at the university, you inadvertently sometimes place obstacles in the path of the students. And so we've actually done that. And uh, you know, one of the examples that I can uh, cite is that we had a general education curriculum that required by mandate from the, uh, 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 Missouri 42 credit hours, and we had added nine to it, just to make sure that they really were well prepared with the general education goals and all that. So we took that away, and, uh, and we've done a few other things, uh, in particular uh, to help students uh, uh, deal with, as I said, with the uh, financial issues. Uh, some other stuff that I wanted to tell you, we have about 40% uh, recipients, uh, students, 44% or so are first generation at the university. Our default rate is, uh, is less than 10%, about 9.7. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, citing uh, one of the uh, centers, the Center for Policy, uh, Budget and Policy that uh, Dr. Garcia mentioned, Missouri actually has gone down in terms of the funding per student by about 27% or 28% in the last, uh, between 20, 2008 and 2018. So we, we're dealing with, with significant challenges uh, internally. But I will tell you, um, one of the things that uh, we're working very hard, and by the way, you know that the uh, uh, graduation rates in Missouri are going down. Uh, and so uh, we have less students and then all of the universities in Missouri are competing for them. So literally, I don't think I am exaggerating if I say that, the, that there is a brutal war going on at the, in, in the state for, for new first-time freshmen. So what we're trying to do is, is work with uh, institutions. I also visit high schools. I've been going around the high schools uh, to develop a, what I call a personal relationship with them. I go and see and talk to the uh, to the principal or the superintendent. And one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to work with the, with, the, with the teachers in the high school that graduated from our university to have them be recruiters for us. We also, when we visit high schools, we take students who graduated from that high school and are at the university back with us so that they can talk to the students when they're there. Uh, so we're also working with the churches, uh, not to the degree and uh, as enhanced as a way that, that you do it in California, you did it. Uh, but we individually, this institution is working with churches to, to, uh, to achieve uh, more of a connection with the community. We need to make them realize that, that college is doable and that it's important that they, that they try. So there, there are four specific initiatives that I would like to share with you that we've done and some of them have been described by others here. We actually have an emergency fund also. And the emergency fund, we worked with United Way. And so United Way actually accepts uh, donations that can go to that, uh, to that uh, emergency fund. And so when, an, uh, when a student has any kind of problems like paying rent or, or utilities or books or a house fire, you name it, they actually receive uh, funding from that particular fund. It's, it's a grant, it's not a loan. And, and uh, that's been very well received. We've had that for a few years. Uh, when I say a few, maybe three or four. Um, we actually have recently, well, the state of Missouri has recently put in place a, a so-called fast track scholarship. And this fast track scholarship uh, is one that is used for adults, uh, individuals who have limited high, uh, college or no college and that they have to be at least 25 years old, they have to have a maximum income of so much, I think about 40,000 or so a year, and they're eligible then to receive this grant from the state so that they can receive their, their degrees. So we're, 
We're very pleased that just started this year, so we are in the process of implementing it, and this, this very semester is the first one that is, is going on, and we have 15 students. And the way that we uh, identify the students is actually they apply to the state, and then the state uh, uh, sends the information to the universities when the where the students want to, want to go to school. Uh, we also have a, a partner with a private foundation, and that private foundation and us, we have agreed that we cover up to $3,000 um, that uh, is due, that the student didn't pay. So if they owe up to 3,000, the foundation pays half of that amount and we pay half of that amount. Uh, and so that's something that is, uh, is in place now and, uh, and, and it's, it's helping. Uh, so we, the university doesn't have to absorb uh, all the loan that, uh, all the money that is owed by the student. We also have reorganized and redefined and I guess re our uh, financial aid institutionally. Uh, we have now what we call the Copper Dome. Copper Dome is, is a, the copper, the dome, uh, the university in the main building is a Copper Dome. And we have, we call it the Copper Dome Scholarship Program. And what we are doing now is instead of we, looked, we did an analysis of how we allocated our financial aid institutionally, and we realized that we were f uh, funding about 30% of the incoming uh, first-time freshmen. And many of them received, uh, of course, full rights uh, <coughs> to the university. We reorganized that, and so now what we do is we, f we actually scholarship about 70% of the incoming students. Uh, we only f offer five presidential scholarships of $10,000 each. The other ones uh, are lower. And we have a matrix where the students automatically see what they're going to get depending on their ACT and, the, uh, and their GPA. Now, ACT, by the way, is optional uh, in our case. Uh, if they don't want to uh, take that standardized test, they don't have to. And the point is, uh, the students now know ahead of time what scholarship they're going to get if they come to us. And we are finding very, very positive reaction to that. This is the first year that we have put it in place. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, we have now implemented what we call the Will to Do Award. The Will to Do is a, is a motto that we use at the university. And it's a new program for Pell eligible students. Um, that have a 2.75 or higher and have a gap in their tuition and general fees compared to their gift aid. And so essentially, if they're Pell eligible, they have 2.75 at least, they, we supplement everything so they don't have to pay any tuition or fees at the university. Well, general fees, uh, course fees are different. So that we just put in place and it's been uh, very well received. Um, so, um, there are lots of things that I could tell you. We are pay putting a lot of emphasis now in talking and spending time with the parents of the students, not only with the students. And when I go and visit high schools, I uh, organize uh, uh, sessions with, uh, with uh, parents because uh, for the many reasons uh, that uh, uh, Juan just mentioned, that sometimes they uh, don't unnecessarily understand the lingo. They don't understand the terms. Uh, and the translation becomes an issue. So uh, I think they become very comfortable when they have somebody there who, who speaks their language and can, I, they can identify with. Um, having said that, we have a very, uh, we are committed very seriously to, to quality. And, and, and I'll make a point here. I think this is the white elephant in the room. We continue to, to, to receive less and less resources from the state. But nobody that I know of, probably in this room and many, across higher ed says that the quality of their education is going down, right? We receive less and less money, but we never say that our quality in education goes down. Why? Because if we say that, then, then, then we're going to be shooting ourselves on the foot, okay? But that's a reality. When you receive less resources, the quality of what you can deliver suffers, okay? So what we have done is we have made a very concerted effort uh, even though we have uh, had to have budget cuts and all that, the faculty positions have not been eliminated. And we have over 30 specialized accreditations at the university. 
and we continue to work on, 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 on getting some more. We are making a sacrifice to make sure that we have the kind of programs that are going to give the students the experience that they expect uh, when they come to the university. So as an example, we have one of only two journalism programs in the state of Missouri that are accredited. One, the University of Missouri, which everybody knows, Mizzou, right? And us is the second one. We, come up with, we continue to come up with new academic programs. We have the first and only uh, program on drones at the, at, in the state of Missouri, so you can get a bachelor's degree in unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, we have the same thing on, on GIS, Geographic Information Science. We have continued to develop uh, new programs, and we are looking at not just adding programs, but seeing what should be going, going away so that we can have a program that makes sense and is relevant for the students. I will stop now because I think that we are running out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. So I asked to go last, and now I'm really, really regretting that. <laughs> Because my colleagues, before, as we came up here, they said, okay, yeah, Cindy's going to be last, and she's going to put it all together and make us look really, really good. Hi, <laughs> my friends. My Dakota name is Star Horse Woman, and I come from the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation in Fort Totten, North Dakota. I'm president of Chanduska Chistana Community College, and I've been blessed in that I was asked to come home 17 years ago to be the president of my tribe's college. And today's a good day. Traveling yesterday, not so good. <laughs> so I want to start by, and maybe most of us got caught up in the Thanksgiving tra travel stuff yesterday. I live in North Dakota. We had a blizzard. It took me all day to get here yesterday. Um, but Creator's good and brings us together when we're supposed to be together. Um, I actually brought a, a pound or a five pound box of commodity cheese. <laughs> <laughs> to my daughter in the cities for Thanksgiving dinner because one of my brothers who's developmentally disabled gets commodities. And we fight over it. I grew up with commodity cheese. And I actually, I tell people the story of, um, I'm fairly well off, okay? For me, where I came from, who I am. Um, but I grew up on commodities, and my grandma taught me how to cook canned beef and some other stuff that's <laughs> not so good. But cook it well. And to this day, in my cupboard, I have a stash of commodity food <laughs> because I have strong memories of being hungry and not understanding and knowing who I was, where I came from, uh, let alone getting an education and becoming a college president is like, really? You don't aspire to these things. But Thanksgiving is, is one of the stories of indigenous people that is still misconstrued and we're pushing hard for people to be better educated, to better understand what was that story, what really happened. It's tied into this, believe me, and hopefully what I present to you will, will tie this all together. But when it, somebody asks me about what's Thanksgiving, what does it mean, you know? You're Indian, you're Dakota, tell me. Supposed to know everything. Watch it, I don't know. <laughs> but it was really about communal. It was about people getting together and sharing. And, and sharing in a good way, in a respectful way, and really helping. And that's the essence and basis of tribal colleges and universities. And um, given what Dr. Garcia presented, and it was a great presentation, thank you so much for all that information and knowledge. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got so much more to learn. There are 37 tribal colleges and universities in this country. We have 75 campus sites. We are in 16 states. We estimate we cover about 90, 80 to 90% of Indian country. We all do associate degrees. 
16 now have bachelor's program and five have master's program. We serve over or close to 15,000 degree-seeking academic students, but an additional 100,000 for community education programming. On average, our students are essentially single mothers who work full time. For my college particularly, my student is, seven, is 28 years old, single mother who does work full time, is trying to be a full time college student. National average, our student is about 65% female, 35% male, but it varies from each of our colleges in that, and we're seeing a lot more younger men coming into our institutions. We have open enrollment. Anybody is welcome to come to our colleges. We do serve our respective communities, but nationally about 15% of our students are non-native. And we could have a symposium about that issue. What do you mean non-native? So it's farm and ranch neighbors who live on or near the reservation. Um, it's Indian people or non-Indian people who are close to the reservation or close to the tribal college. And we're very affordable, we're very accessible. We're right there. Um, it's people who have married into our families. And it's also tribal people who are not enrolled. That's a whole nother said symposium we don't have time for. But just to the point, 15% of our students nationally are non-native students, and we welcome any and everybody to come. We're accredited just like you are by the same accrediting bodies that accredit mainstream institutions. We are public institutions. Uh, last year, 2018, Diné College, the first tribal college in this country, celebrated its 50th anniversary. We've been here. We are chartered by our respective tribes. That's what makes us different and unique. There's a few anomalies within our 37 tribal colleges and university in that we have a couple of federal institutions. Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, Haskell Indian Nations University in Haskell or Lawrence, Kansas, and SIPI Southwest Indian Polytech Institute in uh, Albuquerque. Um, there are a couple of other little anomalies, but most all tribal colleges and universities have been chartered by a tribal government or a tribal organization to be who we are. Our core mission for every tribal college university is the teaching, the learning, the perpetuation of our respective cultures and languages. That's our core mission for every one of us in some form or variation. We were formed because of the failure of mainstream institution in graduating indigenous people. And 50 years ago, so you had civil rights movement, you had a lot of the American Indian movement activism, you had the, um, the Vietnam War going on. There was a lot of more social activism going on. And um, bless our ancestors and the founders of the tribal college movement at that time who joined in to create a tribally controlled higher education system. We are also known as land-grant institutions in the world of land-grant USDA. We're known as the 1994s. So that's the year our legislation came to be. And I'd like to point out, okay, so good old federal government, their infinite wisdom, yeah, sure, tribal colleges can be tribal land-grant institutions, you know, but we're not gonna give them any land. Let's not give the Indians land, duh. <laughs> that, that could be a whole nother symposium too. But we do have a few funding pots and streams within the USDA, including an equity endowment account that we draw upon to help them um, uh, provide some resources to our institutions. Our primary funding is federal. Some of us do get a little bit of state money. Um, maybe depending upon where we're located and the resources of our tribes, we get some funding from our tribal government, but it's, it's iffy. Um, of all our tribal college and universities, only Salish Kootenai, SKC, who was mentioned earlier up in um, Pueblo, Montana, is the only one that does student loans. None of us don't. I think in the beginning, most of our institutions did loans, but we got into trouble. <laughs> our students and families got into trouble. And for me, that's reflective of endemic poverty. Not having money, not understanding money, budgeting, financing, and all of that. So SKC right now is the only one of the 37 tribal colleges and universities that do student loans. We have an advocacy organization called AHEC, the American Indian Higher Ed Consortia, based in Alexandria, Virginia, that serves all the 37 institutions. We also created a little bit later um, the American Indian College Fund, which is our fundraising organization. 
Um, and both of these organizations do just <coughs> phenomenal work, uh, research-based work relative to Indian higher education and the work that we do. Um, I'm going to segue into talking, and our charge as panelists were, was to really respond to Dr. Garcia's presentation. And that, so I really, I take my homework assignments literally. <laughs> better, be, better be prepared. But, um, so one of, the, one of the things I caught early on in her presentation was um, about making systemic change when you're talking about college affordability. So, okay, most all of us are presidents or some high level official at your respective institution. How do you do that? How do you make systemic change? Um, and I'll challenge each of you because as a president, you got more freedom than you realize and more flexibility than you realize. But the point I want to make and speak on behalf of the tribal college and universities is that um, systemic change does need to happen, but I truly believe the TCUs are the most affordable institutions in this country. <laughs> Our average tuition and fees is, is about 3,500. Uh, academic year, it's about 14,500. Um, average, um, for all 37 tribal, tribal colleges and universities, our average credit hour rate is 113. So just, and I know you all know your own numbers, so it's like just put that into perspective and that. But we're very affordable in addition to being accessible based on where we're located and that. Um, Dr. Garcia talked about how language matters. And for me, as a Dakota woman, um, I had to introduce myself to you in my Dakota name. That's how I've been taught by my grandma and grandpa, my aunties, my uncles, you know, tell people who you are. Let them know who you are as a Dakota. She also spoke about this word about, she doesn't like minority, well, neither do we. <laughs> and we Native people, we don't consider ourselves a minority. We are this country's first citizens. We've always been here. We're not going away. <laughs> um, and because of, of the work we do at the TCUs, um, she made the point, Dr. Garcia made the point about different services. All right, the, but that's the foundation of our work. And yes, I'm an advocate for the Tribal College and University, but I believe part of why you're all here, because you are also. You believe in what you do. You're advocates for what you do. And this thing about affordability, it affects and it happens to all of us. It affects us all in different ways in that. Tribal colleges and universities are so good at being community-based, family-based, culturally orientated institutions. And sometimes we call ourselves place-based institutions and, and that's, that's true also. But we need help. We always need help. Um, Dr. Garcia talked about the inheritance of poor people being education. Get an education, get an education. And as a child, I remember that on my Scandinavian side. That's where the Lindquist comes from. <laughs> um, education, education. But it was never something to aspire to in my family. I'm the eldest of 14 children uh, because we were too poor. Mm -hmm. how, how am I going to go to college? You know, how, you know. I, uh, my, my dream as a high school student was to become a history teacher, but there was no money for college in that. And that, I think that foundation, that theme is still there for all of us in many ways, and it, it, it plays out in different ways in that. But for a Native person, we don't think of <coughs> inheritance in that manner, especially from a Western perspective relative to collecting things and materialism and all that. So for us, our inheritance is our culture, is who we are and what we know, what we understand and who we are in being Dakota or Shoshone or Dene or whatever uh, tribal affiliation we come from. Um, it's more about um, teaching about cultural pride, striving for health and well-being for ourselves as individuals, but more importantly for our families, our communities. It's a collective and it has this rippling thing. It's not just about me individually. It's living in a responsible way with Mother Earth and applying common sense. This is accomplished via education, academic learning, as well as life relationships. My North Star goal 
I'm referring to what um, Dr. Garcia talked about, is about free tuition. I do charge tuition at my college. I wish I didn't have to, and someday we're not going to. Um, but it's more on this, on this social, more subjective thing about community well-being and living with the values that was taught to me by my grandparents, the values of compassion, generosity, fortitude, respect. But as a president, I also want, I also need terminal degrees <laughs> and in the whole gamut of, of the professions for the reservation community. Dr. Garcia made five points relative to affordability of college. Increasing PAL, number one. Yeah, and let's not just double it, let's triple it. And let's make it year round. And if you don't say it out loud and say, well, this is what we're gonna do, it doesn't happen. So I'm saying right now, all of us right here, we're going away saying we're gonna triple PAL. <laughs> it's gonna take a heck of a lot of work given the Congress we have, but that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> Partnerships and collaborations are in instrumental in the success of affordable higher education. Those partnerships and collaborations, for the most part, do not cost. You know, and I'm very appreciative of the Department of Education and Dr. Harrell for bringing us together with partners such as ASQ, you know, AHEC, you know, HS, you know, HBCUs. I mean, it's just all of us is like, oh my gosh, we just learned so much from each other. I'm going to borrow all my ideas. I've stolen from all of you now today and going home and can I apply this, can I apply this, can I do that? But we need to keep doing that. We need to facilitate that statewide, regionally, nationally, and then to push that agenda relative to um, policies. Can we simplify FAFSA? Oh gosh, <laughs> wouldn't that be the magic bullet? I have to believe we can, but I don't know. It's part of an entrenched bureaucracy and I understand how and why it's come to be the way it's come to be. You know, the checks and balances, the rules, regs, it's all good intentions and stuff, but it's like, oh my gosh. But you're all brilliant people. And we have brilliant economists and finance people work at our institutions. Let's put those minds together, figure this out. How do we simplify it? How do we make it accessible to everybody online? And everybody knows how to complete that. Um, it's hard from my perspective relative to just the FAFSA because I struggle. I average 200 students a semester at my little tiny college. Um, I should have 300, but that, that's a whole nother thing too. Out of my 200 students on average, I get maybe 120 of them to fill out FAFSA. Okay, and out of that 120, maybe 100, 110 or so, are, um, they, get, they get accepted or, or eligible. Part of the problem then that becomes is that um, EFC thing, estimated family contribution, which they essentially make up because <laughs> they don't have no money, <laughs> but you have to put something in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like so stupid in that. But I tell my financial aid people, just help them fix it, just do it so we can get that financial need and we'll use Project Success Emergency Fund as best we can to cover those gaps and or the Chandeska's Angel Fund, which complements Project Success Emergency Fund to fill in the gaps in that for what we know the family or that student cannot cover. Um, this is a, one of the hugest stressors I have as a president of a tribal college. My community in Benson County, North Dakota has double the U.S. poverty rate, close to 30%. We have a 50, 60% unemployment rate on my reservation. It's endemic poverty and it's learned dependency. So how do you break that when I'm geographically isolated? We have lovely North Dakota weather <laughs> there. We have all these compounding factors. They're not prepared, you know, besides the poverty and then not understanding the language of, of that form and filling it out and what do you mean? You know, no, I kind of, I live alone. I'm not dependent on my mom and dad except I live with mom's house because there's no housing, there's no place to live. It, it gets complicated, you know, but tribal colleges and probably all of you, you, you understand these things about our students. Paid part, paid internships. Yeah, but let's take it further. Department of Ed, connect work study, internships, get Department of Labor to put those apprenticeship things with it too. 
So there's a whole pathway. That's what I need. I need a whole pathway from starting in high school. And then once I get them from high school and they do my weekend academies for literacy and for STEM, they come to Chandeska for their associate's degree. I'm going to transfer them out to NDSU for engineering as an example. I need a pathway and I need it paid for. Work study, internships, apprenticeship. And then whatever money I can find to help them, if it's a diverse scholar from United Health Foundation or wherever, state of North Dakota, you know, help us figure that out. Let's do a better job of putting those things together and demanding that. I'll work the North Dakota Congressionals to help you do this, but we've got to. At the same time in doing that kind of stuff, um, data, accountability, transparency, those checks and balances, we all know what that is. And we're all really good at it whether it's accreditation, iPads, for tribal colleges we do things called Ames ACUS. We're also part of the, Na uh, the National Student Clearinghouse now. North Dakota's got one called SLED, Longitudinal, which is more on that workforce end, employability end. Uh, that we do all of that, you know. Part of my issue locally is, is tribal <coughs> jobs and creating that pathway for tribal jobs and getting the federal government, especially the Department of Labor, to recognize tribal employment, tribal government, the Indian Health Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the tribal college. You know, we have a Sioux Manufacturing on my reservation. We also have casino employment on my reservation. But I want those defined as high demand jobs in Fort Hot, North Dakota, because that's where my students are going to work. But help me create that pathway and that connectedness. So as presidents, we can do this. We can advocate and push for this. Let's. Let's just do it. Community forums, that you, you just articulated some great examples in your presentation, Dr. Um, Garcia, but we're really good at community forums in Indian country. And usually it's around food. <laughs> and yes, commodity cheese <laughs> is included in that also. But we do have a lot of food insecurity in that. We just, at my reservation, my college, we just did several different food drives. We also did a winter coat drive in concert with the University of North Dakota County Department in that, because um, people need coats, people need food. It's North Dakota, it's winter and weather in that. But we partner with the school and the school programs, the tribe, the businesses and stuff to do these things. And we also utilize different things relative to like project success, emergency aid funding from project success. And along with the coll my colleges, we have the Angel Fund. Um, it's our responsibility to bring people together as presidents. That's what is about, that's leadership. Um, and by the way, if anybody does know that billionaire person, <laughs> or if you have a billionaire friend, please, I would really like to meet that person. <laughs> so I could bring them to Fort Dot in North Dakota, preferably not in January, <laughs> when the weather probably won't let them get there, but. Um, Dr. Garcia closed or made a comment about meeting people where they're at. And she gave us some really good, good examples. And if I remember my own educational journey, uh, particularly my doctorate degree, when I was learning about education theories, and that I think that's the constructivist learning theory, <laughs> learning where people are at, um, I really believe the tribal colleges are that. We live that, we experience that, because we kind of have to. But it's also more culturally relevant for us. The American Indian College Fund.org, if you're interested, our fundraising organization, they partner with Gallup. And Dr. Garcia mentioned Gallup. There's a new report out about our institutions from our alumni. And for me, this report just validates what I know as a tribal college president about how good we are at what we do with very, very little resources in that. Um, you could go to the college fund dot, uh, or website to find that report, but Gallup was really astounded by the findings because our markers from our students kind of went off the charts. And this is a study that's been going on across this country for years with HBCUs, Hispanic institutions, and mainstream, in, uh, uh, mainstream institutions for a long, long time, and we worked hard. We pushed for several, several years to get a tribal college Gallup poll survey, and that report is done and out. Um, my point in bringing that up relative to the topic of co college affordability, our alumni are saying we're very affordable. We measured out almost all those markers from that poll of doing really, really good work. Uh, it's very intense work because it's more one-on-one. -on -one. 
in that. But we provide higher education opportunities for our communities um, to, so our people become independent and self-sufficient. That's our goal. That's what we try to do. <coughs> As a college president engaged in higher education and working with compassionate partners, such as the Department of Ed, ask you, all of you here today, um, I want to close with just telling you that never, never forget, education is a lifelong journey. And from where I come from and how I've been taught, um, it's really sacred work. And, and when I became a tribal college president, I went to ceremony uh, to ask for help and guidance. And, and one of the things that the healers, the medicine people said to me was, you're where you're supposed to be now. This, you were supposed to come home and do this and be present. I'm like, oh, I never thought I'd be doing this kind of work, you know, whatever. But um, they use this word or this, this phrase called daku wakanskaska. Daku wakanskaska. And it, it's hard to translate Indian words, Dakota words, into English, but it translates um, something wholly moving. And so when I became Chandeska Chisna Community College's president, the medicine people on my reservation told me I was part of something wholly moving. And to never forget that and who I was, where I'm coming from, and that education truly is the answer. Education truly matters. And there's all kinds of education at different levels, different types, all of that. And it's all good, and it's all relevant. And so I share that with you because that's who you are. So thank you all so very much for being here and being part of this. Let's figure this out together, and let's continue the journey. Mitakiwasi, we're all related. Tadamia. Thank you. Join me again, please, in giving our panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. And uh, an eager beaver, ready to go. I love it. Uh, so now's the time for you to, you've got some questions you want to pose to these folks about some of the statements, their experiences they've shared about their institutions, their perspectives. Let's go for it. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> what I want to talk about is that for the last 30 years in this country, there's been a great con game that's going on in this country. And it's filtered down into the higher education community. And that is we're ripping off students with a high cost of attendance, which re results in more students having to take out student loans. So that's one thing that I'm going to present in this presentation. The second thing is the Lakota model of leadership. The Lakota model of leadership is you always do what is in the best interest of your people. And so let's look at what has got us to this situation that is fil filtered down to the minority serving institutions. When I was a state legislator, a state senator, there was a bill on the floor to give the governor uh, additional salary. And I got up and I said, I can't support this until the, <coughs> the teachers in our school system received a comparable salary. And one of the senators came back and said, if you don't like what we're doing here, why don't you go back to where you came from? So I've had this type of perspective in my life. The issue is in regards to what has happened in this country is that when they gave, gave that governor that salary, it was based on a salary survey. When I got on the health board for <clears throat> our hospital in Rapid City, I immediately knew more higher salaries were coming for the top administrator because they did a salary survey. And they said, well, we need to give our uh, CEO $300,000. When he left two years ago, he was making a million dollars. So <clears throat> I believe that a cr criminal conspiracy occurred in this country 30 years ago when faculty and administrators said, how can we make more money? And you know what the solution was? Higher tuition. That's where a huge mistake was made in this country because we are nonprofit institutions. We all hold 501c3 designations. If you are a 501c3 designation, you have a public trust. 
you have a public trust to who your constituency is. So for us as minority institution, if we are charging our minority people more than what they can afford and what they will end up in debt, that is theft. That is pure out and out theft. Now there is a model. In 1995, we were established as a model institutions for excellence by the National Science Foundation. Our cost of operation is 40% less than state institutions. And all of you could do the same. You could operate at 40% of less of what you're charging your students today. You won't do it because you like the money. But if you follow the Lakota model, you do what's the best interest of your people. You do it because your people will be better off if you operate it like we do. And so that's the major point. We've had great success. Our students uh, come, and if they don't have any, any resources to attend our institution, they still can come to our institution because we have a major donor program that we raise huge sums of money. So when a student graduates from our, our college, he graduates debt free. We, we have them accumulate debt, but the donors pay it off on a special appeal that we send out to our donors. So it can be done, it can be done. And that's what I want you to know. As leaders of your institutions, I know when I die and I meet my maker, and he asked me, did you do what is in the best interest of your people? I can say yes. But can you, who are now the fat cats in your own minority communities, can you say that when you're making $200,000, $250,000 at college presidents, maybe 100000 $100, or more? Our faculty have forty dollars to $60,000 in their salaries. That's the reason we're able to operate at 40% less than what other institutions do. And it can be done. And that is the model of who we are. And that's the model of who you should be as minority serving institutions. No minority in this country should ever be allowed to <coughs> end up with huge debts. And we had a comment here that, uh, well, you know, Green and Barrett, the parents are going to have to uh, have more expenses towards. That isn't the way it should be. What we have given to this country, when America went to war, who went to war for America? It was blacks, Hispanics, and Indians. America owes it to us that our people do not leave an institution with debt. That is our res that should be the responsibility of this nation to us as minorities. And unless you fight for that, fight not only to get more money, but also to reduce your cost of operations, you will have failed your people. Thank you. I'm going to ask, uh, I think Dr. Lawson wanted to come in. <laughs> you may take the mic. Tom, thank you for your passion. Would it be that all of us would have the opportunity to allow our students to leave us with no debt? That is certainly a challenge that you put in front of us, and thank you for doing that. Um, the other thing that I... <laughs> no, because I, I sincerely, I've known him for some time, and I know he is very passionate, and if, if we could create that possibility for students to leave us, minority-serving institutions with no debt, that is truly an impactful opportunity for all of us, and hopefully we can go back and in our own ways look for ways to create that. So when students walk across the stage, even if there is no billion dollar benefactor, that we can do what we can do to lessen the burden that they have. And I know it also in the state of Texas, the 60 by 30 plan says that the students should be able to graduate and earning a degree making with not more than 50% of the owing of the value of their income being more than 50% of the debt that they own. 
So there are challenges underway. I, I had here with me this brochure, and I failed to mention one of our most significant partners, and that is the Trellis Organization. And so my apologies to Trellis, but when we're talking about the project success, they have stepped in at St. Philip's College and all of the Alamo Colleges, and I know they're partnering with other colleges, to help support students that have emergency needs and loans. Uh, where they will cover the cost of paying a utility bill or rent or something of that nature. So I did want to acknowledge that one of our most significant partners at St. Philip's College and the Alamo Colleges is the Trellis Organization. And I brought the brochure to hold up and I <laughs> forgot to do that, so I wanted to do that, uh, but certainly not to ignore what uh, my colleague Tom has said. And so. thank you for that. And immediately following this session, we are going to have a brief overview about project success. Yeah. And I know you don't want to miss that. We have representatives from Trellis, who's Trellis, here, yes, and uh, the Sendem Corporation, yeah. and as well as Educational Credit Management Corporation, our guarantee agencies who are partnering with us in Project Success. So if you haven't heard about Project Success, hold tight. If you have heard about it, hold tight. We've got a great session coming up, and we're going to get you out of here this afternoon on that. Now, questions for the panelists or other comments? Yes. Yes, first I want to say thank you for your efforts and your work. Uh, the passion was evident in your, uh, your speeches and your response to Dr. Garcia. And so I'm blessed to be in a room with people who are working hard in the trenches. We're working in a different space, but you guys are on, on uh, with legs and ground, feet on the ground every day. And so we appreciate your efforts. My question is about uh, accelerated bachelor's programs. I think Dr. Munez, you uh, talked about this. How can uh, you, as well as informing us at the federal level, partner better with high schools to lessen the debt burden associated with college? And how can people do better to increase their credit hours as they matriculate from high school to into the college ranks? I'd love to hear your thoughts and uh, feedback on that. I'll mention something about uh, dual credit, dual enrollment, and then a program in the state of Texas called the Affordable Bachelor Degree. I think people are enamored, I think, for the right reasons, the idea of accelerating students, uh, high school students' uh, accumulation of, of, of rigorous college credit hours. I think that there's some internal uh, conversations about whether all college credit delivered for dual credit is sufficiently rigorous. Uh, we still need to work on that. There are some uh, community colleges systems, you know, uh, some uh, college might have multiple campuses that may be doing it better than others, but there's no doubt that these students, if they're in a clearly articulated program of study, accumulating rigorous, rigorous college credit that can be applied to a degree, uh, for example, uh, deliberately in early college high school programs. I mean, those, those, those young people are going to a four-year school and finishing in two years. Uh, we have a grant through the, uh, called the, 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 the Greater Texas Foundation specifically for early college high school graduates. I was on, in a high school a week ago, and uh, they have a great many options for higher education. They're coming uh, with considerable, with an AA or an AS degree. So there, there's those kinds of partnerships. You have to work very carefully, the four-year schools with the two-year schools, to make sure that this isn't just attempted credit hours, but applicable credit hours. Applicable regardless of who the department chair is, the college dean, or the president. It, it has to be more than an MOU, an understanding. It has to be a contract. Okay, that's one thing. And then uh, a few years ago, former Governor uh, Rick Perry introduced the idea of a $10,000 degree. The idea of how do you work with a community college uh, to offer very, very inexpensive, affordable, uh, rigorous uh, coursework and recognize some people that had been working in a profession of study, an applied, an applied area for 10, 20 years and test them for competency academic competency, and you couple the academic competency trained and verified, okay, with community college credit and four-year courses to accelerate them toward, uh, toward a degree in an applied, what's called a BAS, a Bachelor's of Applied Arts and Sciences in leadership, in manufacturing, a baccalaureate degree for someone that otherwise would never have an opportunity for a bachelor's degree and then all of the professional plateaus that they'll never get past in the absence of that degree. So again, we need to think creatively. These are not um, without challenges and without some examples of failures, but, but I, I certainly believe that they offer more promise for an evolving population of higher education that needs more sort of lines of service 
more, more mechanisms to baccalaureate completion than currently exist in an accelerated manner. I'd like to also address that from a two-year perspective. We have in the Alamo Colleges what we have established is transfer advising guides, and we're partnering with some of the institutions that are in here uh, with presidents that we have uh, been intentional about. One of the things that we looked at is the students were simply taking too many hours at our institution, so they had exhausted much of their financial aid before they transferred to the four-year institution. So we've been intentional about that. We first looked at the top seven institutions that our students were primarily transferring to and began to work with those institutions. And now we have expanded it to many more institutions in uh, our community. And we have what we call TAGS, Transfer Advising Guides, where we have worked deliberately with that institution such that the credits will count in their major so the students will not have to repeat those courses. So working the, um, intentionally with uh, presidents of other institutions where we are signing agreements about the transfer guides and guide, advising guides and articulation plans. And then with our two-year institution, our early college high school, St. Phillips has an early college high school. The concern about they not having the credit is not sufficient or the rigor is not sufficient. 98% of the students in our St. Phillips Early College High School were labeled as being at risk. 28% of those children are in tier one institutions and they are still there. And our first graduating class was last year and we were listed in US News and World Reports about being one of the best high schools in the nation at the bronze level. So the things that we have been doing with those students and working with the universities has produced great uh, outcomes for us. I Thank you. I think that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Early college obviously is a great alternative and it works very, very well for a specific group of students. And I, again, you know, just to go with what Juan was saying, we have to really recognize the whole variety of students that we have. And uh, in, in the case of us, we, we have a partnership with Mass Bay Community College and also with the high school system in, in, uh, in Framingham. But we have also a lot of students that are language learners. We have the larger Brazilian population in New England, in Framingham. We have a growing Hispanic population, a lot of immigrants coming in that they, they do not have the language skills. So we have to be very careful not to create now a two-tier system in which students that uh, happen to be here when they started first grade and are fluent in English can benefit from these programs and students that came in when they are in seventh grade, eighth grade may, have, may not benefit from the programs at the same rate. So that's something that we have to, uh, to think about. We also have to think about the level of maturity that the students have graduating from high school. Some students that we get are wonderfully ready to get a bachelor's degree in two years. Some students are not emotionally ready for that. They need the experience of college. Some of them are looking at that college thing as something that they have to do. So I, I, as I said, I, I think it's a great thing. It's a fantastic thing. And not only accelerate bachelor's degrees, I think that four plus one programs for master's degrees as well are really important to give the students the credentials that they need, especially in, a, in, a, in an area like Massachusetts that is so high technological, is everything is biotech and high tech. But you know, we just have to be careful about how we do it so that we do not create a, an additional problem for uh, students that, do not, that will not see themselves as being part of that elite, sophisticated, chosen group. And we want to have all the students succeeding, not, so, not only small groups. So that's just some random thoughts about uh, about the, about the early college issue. May I uh, comment? Please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for the, uh, the question. Dual credit is a program that we have uh, instituted at uh, Southeast Missouri State University to the degree that we actually currently offer probably about 20% of our credits in dual credit. We have many students coming into the university with 15, 20, 30, in some cases with literally a, an, an associate degree by the time they get into the university. And uh, as the uh, prior speakers have mentioned, we are uh, trying to be very careful. So we have a program that is actually accredited. So the, the, uh, the dual credit program is accredited, is reviewed on a regular basis to make sure that we uh, do not uh, lower any of the standards uh, that we have in place. The other thing that I would like to mention is we have put in place a, a, a program, we call it the Transfer Mentor Program, which is really very simple in concept, but very unique in what it does. 
So a student goes into a community college, for example, to transfer them to the university. If they agree to participate in this transfer mentor program, what that does is that the university and the community college agree to exchange transcripts at the end of every semester. So the student can actually, if the student happens to transfer out of the community college before getting the associate degree, they can have those credits at the university validated so they can actually get a reverse transfer. But the other thing that it does is we actually put the student into our student information system. And so as the student is taking classes in the community college, there is an advisor that the student and the advisor at the community college can work with at the university to make sure that the student is taking the courses that are going to be useful for the student when they uh, move into a four-year degree. So we do that on a, on a, on a semester-by-semester semester basis. And so the students uh, can actually play games because we have a system that allows them to see how what they, what they are accumulating is gonna count towards one degree or another degree or another degree. And so the students actually have it very easy to even transfer into university. If they choose to transfer with us, and they don't have to, but if they choose to transfer with us, they already know how all those courses apl apply to the particular degree that they want. So that's something that we are doing to simplify uh, the transfer process and to make it easier for the students to, to, to move in. And the last thing that I will say is we actually work with industry. Uh, we have examples of degrees that we develop jointly with industry so that they can give uh, uh, credit, uh, they can actually reimburse their own employees for, the, for uh, uh, participating in this program. And so they can actually go through it. It can be online and face-to-face and the, 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 the industry looks at the curriculum, they agree with it, they say this is what we need, they, they develop it jointly with our faculty, and so the, the, uh, the, uh, the employees at this in in industry can actually get reimbursement for the tuition. Thank you. Great, join me again please, I'm sorry. Can I come just, just one final, I apologize, just for one final thought, I just, in, in hearing my colleagues, I just think, just, just one thought. Uh, I, I, I don't have a response to the gentleman that spoke earlier, but I admire the, 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 the provocative nature of his, of, his, of his remarks. And I think we need to think a bit provocatively about financial aid, particularly at the federal level. As, uh, you, you've heard descriptions of radically different populations of students of coming into higher ed. And I would ask you, how evolved, how provocative has the system by which we uh, assign uh, eligibility, need, et cetera, evolved in the last 10 years. When I was up at Cupertino visiting Apple once, the guy said, uh, it, current 13-year-olds have never known a universe without an iPhone. I had a 13-year-old at the time, that's why I, I leaned in. <laughs> Think about today's population of students, and yet the way that we're doing this has not evolved to keep pace. And I'll bring you back to a point made by Millie, Dr. Garcia, where students are and where they're going to move to if we want to be about access, affordability, and achievability, and, and an inheritance of prosperity, which has always been part of our country's narrative. So let's be provocative, let's be dynamic, and let's think of new ways to do uh, uh, things uh, and, and maybe take some chances. Thank you. With those closing remarks, please give our panel another round of applause. Thank you very kindly. And we're going to transition right now as they're transitioning. Uh, we have one more session to go and we'll, uh, we'll have you out of here. I know you're eager to explore Reno for those who have not. <laughs> <laughs>